The Heritage Corporation, the world's largest producer of cultural heritage video, is proud to bring you the story of your name. It's a story that has been prepared by a team of dedicated professionals, experts in genealogy, heraldry and history. It's the proud story of your unique Irish heritage. At the end of this video, we'll give you helpful information about touring Ireland. We'll give you a list of our extensive range of name videos, not only Irish, but Scottish and Welsh too. And we'll show you some other attractive gifts that are specific to Irish family names. But for now, sit back and relax as the Heritage Corporation takes you on a very special journey into your past. Walsh, or in the Irish, Brannock, is an old name, a very old name. But nothing in Ireland, except maybe the land itself, is as old as Newgrange. This ancient tomb was over 3,000 years old at the birth of Christ. So for over 5,000 years, it saw the arrivals of the varied peoples that came to our shores and sadly too it witnessed the departure of millions of Irish men and women who left us and today are scattered all over the world. So let us go then, you and I, on an Irish journey, an hour's journey only, but endless in the imagination. A journey right through this beautiful country of ours, along the coasts and into the very lands and territories of your own Irish ancestors. These are the majestic cliffs of Moher. They stand defiant, holding back the relentless waves. Below, the broad Atlantic stretches all the way 3,000 miles beyond the New World. When you stand on these cliffs, you stand on the edge of Ireland, you stand on the edge of Europe. Inland from here lies the fair land of Erin, Ireland, the home of your ancestors. This is the story of your great Walsh heritage. We will trace your name from its earliest origins, following its journey across the green and varied landscape of Ireland, charting the changing fortunes of your illustrious family. Through ancient castles and aging ruins, we will rediscover the stories of the Walshes, tracing their transition from noble Norman lords to courageous Irish rebels. We will discover too, how your name has changed over the centuries and how your ancestors carried it and its traditions with them across the seas to the new worlds. As we hear these stories, we will discover the spirit, the essence of the Walsh heritage, a spirit of courage, independence and resolve which has seen the name survive for nearly a thousand years.
Jewish surnames, which began a thousand years ago, developed in a number of ways. If a family took their father's name, they became known as Mac, like McCarthy, because Mac means the son of. But if they were called after a more remote ancestor, they used the O, which means descended from, as in, say, O'Brien. Meanwhile, the Normans often used Fitz instead of O or Mac, as in Fitzgerald, son of Gerald. Or you could be called after the job you did, as in Smith. Or the place you came from, as in Welsh, from Wales. the 60 million people throughout the world who share an Irish ancestry, St. Patrick's Day is a time for them to come together to celebrate and rejoice in their Irish identity. Although your own family may have left these shores and settled in new lands, it is still possible to trace your ancestors back to their original homelands. Tom Lindert, one of Ireland's leading authorities on genealogy, has some useful advice. Well, it's very important that if someone's interested in doing your genealogy, that you get all your background information in your home country first. Uh, don't just try to jump straight over to Ireland. Um, the, the first thing is that you get a person that you know the most about from Ireland, be it an ancestor. Um, their name, a date to put them in history, be it a birth date, marriage date, or death date. And then a locality, as, as narrow, narrow that down as much as possible, be it a county or a townland. But make sure you have the information together to begin with, and then um, make the next step over to do research in Ireland. Once you have located an ancestor and have some idea of where they originally came from in Ireland, the records which will allow you to trace your family history are, by and large, available to you. The first place to go to is the National Archives at the Four Courts in Dublin. Documents kept here such as Griffith's land valuations of the 19th century and the Thai the Plotman books are invaluable in the search for your ancestors. If we take the case of a namesake of yours, we can illustrate exactly how these documents can help you. Let's look, for example, at the case of Mark Walsh. We know that Mark left Ireland in 1866 or 67 for America, and that he married before he left in early 1866. We also know that the name Walsh at that time was most common in the counties of Cork, Waterford, Kilkenny, and Wexford. At the forecourse, we searched Griffith's valuations and found Mark's family in Ballytarsney Parish, County Kilkenny. Once we had located Mark in this parish, we found a nearby Moon Coin Roman Catholic Church that Mark was baptized on the 8th of March, 1844, the son of William Walsh and Margaret Grant of Ballytarsney. With this knowledge, it is possible to trace the history of Mark's family. So you see, all you need is the basic details about an ancestor and the quest for information on your family roots can begin. The search for your ancestors is becoming easier all the time, thanks to a recent initiative called the Irish Genealogical Project. This is the Clare Heritage Centre in Corofin. The centre is at the very heart of a new and exciting development. The official surviving records relating to family history and genealogy are being collected throughout the county. They're being brought here and then put on computer. But Corofin's not alone in this. Many other heritage centres have opened up all over Ireland, so that no matter where your family comes from, you should now be able to get an accurate record of your family history. It is possible to trace your ancestors even further back beyond your immediate family, but let's start at the beginning and take a look at the history, the culture and the country which shaped your forefathers. On the Aran Islands, off the west coast of Ireland, stands the prehistoric fort of Dún Angus, enigmatic, poised over the ocean, its ancient builders a mystery even to this day. 
Over 7,000 years had passed since the first settlers arrived in Ireland. Hunting in the young forests, they slowly ventured up the river valleys, building their dwellings from rough wood and animal hide, and forming small communities hidden in the forest. Two and a half thousand years before Christ, they had developed a society that was stable enough and wealthy enough to produce these majestic dolmens. This dolmen here is the Paulna Brown dolmen, situated in North Clare in the Burren country. Just another part of the wonderment that is ancient Ireland. They built mysterious circles of standing stones. These people we call the Firbolg or the Fomorians, and the Tuatha de Danon, the legendary children of Dana, goddess of magic. Perhaps these early peoples were among your forebears, people who would have known the names of those who lie under the great dolmens. But older than Paul Nebron, older even than the pyramids, is the passage grave at Newgrange in County Meath. Built over 5,000 years ago and designed so that on the winter solstice each year, at the moment of sunrise, a shaft of sunlight penetrates to the very heart of the mound illuminating the intricate spirals carved in stone. Newgrange was where they paid tribute to their now forgotten gods. These people were superb craftsmen in stone, but a new material was sweeping across Europe from Asia Minor. The Iron Age came to Ireland and the people who introduced the new material around 500 BC were the Celts who for almost 2,000 years ruled Ireland as kings. The Celts were a major influence on the course of Irish history and instrumental in shaping our unique Irish identity. Let's listen to what leading archaeologist Barry Raftery of University College Dublin has to say about the Celts. Well, in the narrowest sense, the term Celtic refers to uh, a, a language, but it is entirely appropriate to use the term in a broad cultural context. Now, the earliest reference to the term Celt was made by the Greeks about the 6th century BC. They just referred to a specific cultural grouping in Europe as Keltoi. We do not, of course, know whether the Celts themselves used that phrase uh, to describe themselves. Now, in archaeological terms, the Celtic culture begins about 700 BC in Europe, continues until it was destroyed by the Romans around about the birth of Christ. And archaeologists have divided this culture into two broad phases named after two major fine spots in Europe, an earlier phase which is called the Hallstatt culture and a later phase which is called the Latin culture. It is the Latin Celts who are best exemplified in the archaeological record. There are very serious problems of archaeological interpretation. But what we can say is that the earliest indications of contact with the Celtic culture abroad appears in Ireland around about 600 BC when there are some indications of a Hallstatt presence in the country. We have some Hallstatt material, but it's not very substantial. Around about 300 BC, there's a greater body of archaeological material in the country which we can certainly equate with the Celtic groups. In many ways, it displays native Irish idiosyncrasies which set it apart from the uh, material in the Latin areas outside the country. We have a vast body of Celtic literature surviving in the country. We have the epic cycle, the Ulster cycle. We have the Fíniachta. We have a whole range of mythology. We have a superb collection of early Irish nature poetry and other poetry. But probably the principal legacy of the Celtic, the most enduring, is our Celtic personality. We certainly have a distinctive personality, a warmth, a friendliness, uh, Classical commentators describe the belligerent character of the Celts. Perhaps we have inherited that too, to a certain extent. But we certainly have a distinctive Celtic personality which sets us apart from all other European cultures.
A small island on the edge of Europe. The island of your ancestors was divided up between a number of major Celtic clans. In the south, in what is now Munster, were the Oinacht and the Dalcash. In Connacht, to the west, were the Ivrin. In the province of Leinster were the E. Hinslig, and to the north, in Ulster, were the E. Nail. These clans were in time joined by the great Viking and Norman families. The Walshers came to Ireland with the Normans in the early 12th century and first put down their roots in the southeast of the country. When the Walshers first came to Ireland, they built many fine castles, like this magnificent castle behind me here at Inish Teague, overlooking the River Nore in South Kilkenny. And from behind castle walls like these, they ruled their territories. Situated in the heart of Ireland, Kilkenny is a green and fertile, tranquil and timeless county, steeped in history and rich in scenic variety. Sometimes breathtaking, always welcoming, Kilkenny is Walsh country. The Walsh family arrived in Kilkenny as part of the Norman invasion of the 12th century. Although not descended from any of the major Celtic clans of Ireland, the Walshers, unlike the Normans, were originally Celts. And so it's no surprise that the customs and habits, the culture and even the language of the clans was to be adopted by the Walshers as they settled into their new lands. So well, in fact, did the Walshers fit into Irish society that they have always been regarded as completely Irish. Indeed, their name cannot be disputed as anything less than 100% Irish, as it was given to them by the native Celts upon their arrival. The story of the Walshers of Ireland starts with three brothers named Philip, David and Geoffrey Fitzantony. These three brothers came to Ireland from Pembrokeshire in Wales in 1169. The native Irish called them Brannock, which simply means somebody from Wales. They settled first in Kilkenny, and so prestigious did it become in this part of the world, they even have a mountain range, the Walsh Mountains, named after them. From the earliest times, the Walsh name spread to different areas of the country. Walshers were to settle in the counties of Leeks, Waterford, Dublin and County Cork, and today they're scattered all over Ireland. But like most Irish families with strong roots associated with one place, the Walshers are still to be found in greatest numbers in Kilkenny, the homeland of their ancestors. Hurling, Ireland's national sport, is reminiscent of the time when the great clans of Ireland battled for land power and the high kingship. It was the strength of Christianity that forged the first real bonds of unity in Ireland. For the Irish took very well to Christianity. So well indeed, that in a very short time her monks had established some of the most important ecclesiastical centers in the Christian world. Here in Glendalough, in County Wicklow, I always think the sense of Ireland's Christian past is particularly strong. There had been small settlements of monks scattered along the Irish coast for some time, but it took St. Patrick to bring together the old religion of the Celts and the new Christianity. This new Irish Christianity turned out to be a powerful crusading force. With the collapse of the Roman Empire, Europe was once more plunged into the Dark Ages. And strangely enough, that's what gave us, I think, our first emigrants, the young Irish monks who left their Irish monasteries and brought the flame of Christianity back into that pagan continent. At home in Ireland, the monks built the unique round towers, originally as bell towers, and then later used them for keeping safe their priceless chalices and manuscripts. In their workrooms, the monks channeled their passionate Celtic sensitivity into glowing color and intricate artwork. And certainly, the greatest and most beautiful of the manuscripts is the Book of Kells, now in the library of Trinity College, Dublin.
The work of the monasteries, however, was to be disturbed by the arrival of the Vikings. For 200 years, they came as pirates to plunder gold from the great Irish monasteries. However, in 1014, they were finally defeated in battle by the High King of Ireland, Brian Boru, after which they became fully integrated into Irish society. The Vikings built Ireland's first towns and cities, including Dublin, Wexford, Cork, and Limerick. And their commercial ability is reflected today in Dublin's famous Wall Street Market. The Vikings left an indelible impression on the Irish. And with their demise as a great power, coupled with the death of Brian Boru, meant in fact that the High Kingship of Ireland was up for grabs. What followed was almost a century of political instability and unrest, in which the greater Irish families fought amongst themselves for the title of High King of Ireland. This struggle in Ireland was to provide your Walsh ancestors with one great opportunity. You see, there were Norman lords in Wales at this time, and when Diarmuid MacMurrah arrived looking for help in his struggle with the O'Rourke back home, one of your ancestors, Philip Fitzantony, saw the opportunity and realized it was too good to miss. Little did they realize as they set sail in their ships for the east coast of Ireland that soon they were to become one of the most influential families in that country. The Normans, led by the great warrior Strongbow, arrived in 1169. Heavily protected by their coats of mail, they moved like modern tanks through the Irish countryside. They had arrived as mercenaries at the request of the deposed King of Leinster, but a combination of their military might and an attraction to the land of your ancestors induced them to make a more permanent foothold. When the Walshers arrived with the Normans, they came not as Norman lords, but as foot soldiers but they were quick to seize every opportunity. When the Normans marched into the city of Cork in 1174, they found a contingent of Vikings waiting for them. Philip Fitzantony single-handedly boarded one of the Viking ships and overpowered the entire crew. Philip's family were justly awarded with lands in County Kilkenny, County Leeks, County Waterwood, and at Bray and Carrick Mines near Dublin, where they established themselves as landed gentry. When the Walshers first came to Ireland, they built many fine castles, like this magnificent castle behind me here at Inish Teague, overlooking the River Nore in South Kilkenny. And from behind castle walls like these, they ruled their territories. Following his victories in battle, Strongbow took the hand of the King of Leinster's daughter, Eva, in marriage. And less than two years later, he had taken the crown for himself. Stony towers are not always protective, for here in Waterford, at Reginald's Tower, the marriage of Strongbow and Eva started a trend that would eventually undermine Norman influence in Ireland. You see, within a century, the Normans and the Irish intermarried, and the Normans adopted the Irish language and culture to a degree that made the English King John declare the Normans are more Irish than the Irish themselves. In the first two centuries following their arrival, your Walsh ancestors grew in strength through some very astute marriages. Philip Walsh married Eleanor, a daughter of the mighty Norman Maurice de Burgo, and was soon afterwards appointed steward of Leinster and then given the title of Baron Sean Cahir by King Henry II of England. With their newfound wealth, the Walshes began to build many fine castles. They also continued to further advance their influence by marrying not only into the local Irish families, but into the important Norman family of Raymond Le Gros. The Walshes used their wealth charitably, however, and on the 12th of September, 1320, William Walsh handed over to the city of Dublin a large plot of land beside the church of St. Thomas the Martyr and the houses of Thomas Street. The city council awarded him 20 pounds as a gesture of thanks for his donation of land. The Walshers, in common with many other Irish and Norman families, began to see the value of intermarriage and the natural alliances that followed. And indeed, things soon settled down and returned more or less to the status quo. 
and the Walshers, having built their court of castles, now turned their attention to the building of many fine abbeys, like this beautiful abbey here at Inish Teague in South Kilkenny. Here at Bonretti Castle, the vibrant atmosphere of that period can be experienced in a banquet that is faithfully recreated using historical records from the time. My noble lords and ladies, my noble guests, the entry of your host this evening, the Earl of Thomond, Mr. Joe Lynch. Food and drink in the old style, music and song. This is how your ancestors entertain their friends. This castle now awakes. Its ancient glory stirs. The clink of mail and laughter fills its halls, and we inherit all its chivalry. Bon Ratty bids you welcome. A toast to all you hear. Slider itself. Let the banquet begin. By the 15th century, your ancestors had assimilated the culture, traditions, and even the language of the Irish to such an extent that they accepted the name of Branoch, given to them by the native Irish. Despite their fortune and fame, they continued a the tradition of religious and charitable work. In the record of the Abbey of the Blessed Virgin Mary in Dublin, we found that William and Thomas Walsh both received substantial pensions of 40 shillings a year for their services to the Abbey. The political situation in Ireland was undergoing great changes at this time. The English crown wished to reduce the power of the independent Norman and Irish lords. The crown insisted that the Irish lords and chieftains surrender their land, offer an oath of allegiance, and then receive their lands back again. It was a piece of legislation which caused great unease among the Irish and would lead to open rebellion. Yet throughout this troubled period, the charitable and religious practices of your Walsh ancestors continued. We know that in 1575, Patrick Walsh was appointed Master of the Beggars and Poor People of the City of Dublin by the then Mayor of the City, John Usher. And by the end of that century, the Archbishop of Cashel was the Most Reverend Thomas Walsh. During the 1500s, the power of the Celtic chieftains began to wane under sustained military pressure from the forces of the English crown. This in turn led to a series of rebellions. The last great Celtic revolt ended here at Kinsale in 1601. It had been led by the mighty Hugh O'Neill of Tyrone. In the year 1609, O'Neill and many of the other Irish chieftains left our shores. This was called the Flight of the Earls. It heralded the end of the old Celtic ways. Now it was a new island, new kings, new centers of power. The Flight of the Earls is a testament to the concept of Ireland as an independent nation, the Celtic aristocracy choosing exile rather than submission. To consolidate their power in Ireland, the new rulers sent out clerks to record the names of Ireland. Unable to speak the Irish language, these clerks did not attempt to properly translate the indigenous names, but rather made approximate and phonetic translations. As you travel through Ireland today, you will notice how the signposts carry evidence of that name-changing process which began so long ago. For example, Bolia on Workig, meaning the town of the Murphys, became Bally Murphy. Cashlorn y Chunil simply became Castle Connell. The Walsh name also went through its own changes. The name originally given to your ancestors by the native Irish in the 12th century was Branock, which simply means Welshman. The Gaelic Branock was sometimes anglicized phonetically as Brana, 
but it was mostly, as with so many old Irish names, translated very literally into the English and became Walsh, sometimes pronounced Welsh. The essential Irish culture, however, remains strong and vibrant, and despite continued assault, it has remained so to this day. The Irish have always been proud of their heritage and culture, and nowhere is this more evident than in the art of heraldry. And here to tell you more about that is the former chief herald of Ireland, Gerard Slevin. Um, heraldry had its origin in the fact that the knight in medieval times, going into warfare, uh, was completely encased in armour, including his head. So there was no means of knowing who he was. So it became the practice to paint on his shield certain emblems or signs or symbols as a means of identification. Uh, heraldry has always had an extraordinary fascination for people, whatever it is about the shield shape and its contents. And in due course, uh, this personal practice spread to cities, universities, institutions, and is still very active. The primary purpose, as I have suggested, was identification. And I suppose that is still the essential purpose of heraldry, is personal or institutional identification. Your coat of arms is a window to your heritage. Each part is full of stories and secrets. The shield displays a red chevron an upside-down V-shape on a silver background surrounded by three broad arrowheads in black. The chevron signifies protection and is also granted to those families who have built great fortresses or cathedrals. The arrowheads are a complex symbol representing affliction, but they are also among the weapons of avengement, suggesting a family swift to retaliate. The crest, which is placed above the shield, shows a swan with a dart passing through it. The swan is the bird of Apollo. It represents lovers of poetry and music, as well as a people renowned for their learning. The motto captures the courage and resilience of this great family. It is in Latin and reads, Transfixus sed non mortuus, meaning transfixed, but not dead. Many Irish people certainly are entitled to use arms, yes. The, the registers of the office of arms, the genealogical office, as it is now, the office of the chief herald, has registers going back many centuries. The 17th century saw England convulsed by two civil wars in which Ireland inevitably became involved. The Second War was actually fought entirely on Irish soil between 1688 and 1691 and led to disastrous consequences for the Irish. Sixteen ninety one saw the ending of the Williamite Wars with the signing of the Treaty of Limerick signed on this very stone. The wars were fought between two kings, William of Orange and James II, both of whom laid claim to the throne of England. In the event, victory went to King William. For the Irish who supported James II, exile seemed to be the only honourable option. Known to history as the Wild Geese, these honourable soldiers of fortune sailed from Limerick to Europe, bringing with them the surnames of Ireland. This ruined castle here is a symbol of the hundreds of years of resistance Irish families put up against, first of all, the forces of Queen Elizabeth I and later on the Cromwellian soldiery. The Walshers were among those families and over the years their resistance became sadly depleted. In time, Many Irish families left our shores and went to Europe as the wild geese. The Walshers were among them. They fought bravely on far foreign fields from Dunkirk to Belgrade. In the wake of James II's defeat, 
the Walshers who had supported him were faced with choosing exile or staying to suffer suppression at the hands of the English. Many of them chose exile as the honorable option and so began the first migration of Walshers from this land. The ship which carried James II to France after the defeat at the Battle of the Boyne was commanded by one Philip Walsh. But the Walshers were great survivors and despite the hardships they endured, these exiles went on to distinguish themselves in the world of politics, religion, commerce and culture in every country they settled in. From the days of the early Christian missionaries to the present day, emigration has been an integral part of the history of the Irish people. From this small nation, millions of Irish people have traveled the world over to Europe, Asia, the Americas, Africa, and Australasia. Although many left in search of adventure or to find their fortunes, many others didn't have the choice. In the aftermath of the wild geese, which had seen the best and brightest of their day depart, Ireland was to undergo many changes, the most dramatic of which was the massive transfer of land ownership. As the land changed, so too did the politics. In 1801, the Irish Parliament in Dublin was dissolved. And as the last vestiges of power dwindled, so too did the wealth of the country, and the land sank into poverty. In 1845, a blight arrived. The potato, the staple diet of the Irish people, was totally destroyed. So began the great Irish famine. And so too began the greatest migration of the Irish people. Plentiful supplies of foodstuffs were exported to Britain while the Irish people were faced with emigration in order to survive. A letter written in 1847 captures the sense of devastation. It is early morning as I write this last note before departing. We now join a huge army forced to leave their native land. The heavy morning mist is a fitting curtain for the final scene, the climax of all our strivings against impossible odds. I cannot help but glance back through the pages of our history to the years when Ireland was a beacon of learning and faith whose light spread to all parts of Europe. God grant that those days of glory may someday return. Irish people emigrated in their hundreds of thousands. They set sail from Cove, Liverpool and Belfast. Cramped together on overcrowded ships, rife with hunger and disease, they arrived in Montreal, New York and Boston. In Australia, famine refugees followed those who had been transported there as convicts. Many of these convicts had been expelled from their home country on charges such as stealing bread. Others were belonging to revolutionary organizations. Despite their impoverished beginnings, the contribution made by those emigrants to their new countries was enormous. In the building of the modern world, from the late 17th century right up to the present day, the Irish have played a vital part in whatever society or culture they have settled in. Today, people of Irish descent number in excess of 70 million worldwide. There have been many illustrious Walshers over the years. The poet John Walsh who wrote the lament for Oliver Grace. The great Kerry author Maurice Walsh who wrote The Quiet Man. The most reverend John Walsh, the Catholic Archbishop of Toronto. And Senator John Walsh of Montana who became Attorney General. The list of famous members of the Walsh family is constantly growing. I keep Much has happened in the 800 years that have elapsed since the first Fitzhenry landed on our shores. After time, 
they adopted and accepted the Gaelic name Brannock, which in English, of course, means Walsh. As a Walsh, when you visit Ireland, you will want to see many counties. But of course, you must come here to Wexford, above all, because here is the essential heart of the Walsh clan. From the early days of Irish history, the great name of Walsh has been at the forefront of Irish life. Those Walshes who chose exile and emigration rather than defeat brought their tradition of courage and wisdom to their new homes. Across the world, the name Walsh is still born with pride. do go to Ireland to trace your roots. Here are some of the things you may